Here's everything you missed from the Deadpool and Wolverine trailer. I promise you, you missed a lot more than you think. So Deadpool's birthday cake has one candle, which is a great idea because Deadpool's immortal. Age doesn't matter anymore, so why would you put 30 some odd candles on there? He's gonna be the same age forever, might as well only have one. Also, all of his friends are back, which is awesome. And we know that some of these people are here because of Deadpool's time travel shenanigans at the end of Deadpool 2. The survival of Vanessa, the survival of Peter. Of course, we get to see Colossus and we get to see Negasonic Teenage Warhead and Yukio. But as we also know from the Loki TV series, messing with time has consequences. And this leads to the arrival of the TVA. Here's the funny thing. The way these soldiers in the TVA look tell us exactly when this movie takes place. Because if you look at the helmets of every member of the TVA in this trailer, it simply just says TVA. But as we know from Loki seasons one and Loki seasons two, all the members of the TVA have their identifying numbers and replacement of their names on their helmets. So these are not the same outfits. And because the TVA plays a starkly different role than it did in Loki season one, pretty much all the way to the end of Loki season two, the outfits of the TVA would also look different. So this movie takes place after the events of Loki season two. Of course, shortly after this, we see that Wade Wilson is taken by the TVA and then he wakes up in the company of Mr. Paradox. Who's Mr. Paradox? Well, Mr. Paradox is a member of the TVA, very similar to Mobius M. Mobius. The difference is that in the comics, he was present during a story called The Trial of She-Hulk. And what had basically happened here during Dan Slott's run with She-Hulk volume two is that due to some time travel shenanigans, She-Hulk had come into contact with Hawkeye before his death during the events of Avengers 500 102, also known as Avengers Disassembled, when the Scarlet Witch killed him. She used sign language, she tried to warn him, and because she was effectively informing Clint Barton of his impending death, thereby altering the time stream, she was put on trial by the TVA. Now, a fat lot of good that did, because basically Mr. Paradox was killed in the exact same issue that he appeared in. So much like Owen Wilson's Mobius character, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is basically going to adjust this guy, because while his character does exist in Marvel Comics, there isn't really anything to change. Also, while Mr. Paradox and Deadpool are walking together, at the very end of the hallway along the wall is basically a mural, and that symbolically represents Loki at the end of Loki season two, and the sense that you have what looks like a set of universes on one side and a set of universes on the other that are basically coalescing into a singular object in the middle. Of course, we know that at the end of Loki season two, that the role that he now plays is to basically stand as the custodian of the multiverse, meaning he's the person that anchors it all together. And because this is what looks like a vertical symbol for infinity, that Loki is destined to do that for all time, always. Now, while Deadpool has shown a screen that obviously shows different versions of Marvel characters that we're familiar with, the Incredible Hulk and Thor and Iron Man and so on, if you look all the way down in the bottom left-hand corner, you will see Deadpool wearing a suit and tie in what looks like the White House. Now, this is clearly a reference to the story Deadpool, Dead Presidents, where Deadpool quite literally fights dead presidents. <laughs> it's amazing. But this could very well be a universe where Deadpool becomes president of the United States, because as we know, the TVA deals with alternate realities. And for every possibility, an alternate reality exists for it. Especially now that we know the sacred timeline doesn't exist the way that it did in Loki season one. So in effect, everything is possible. We also get a glimpse at what appears to be Emma Corrin's character, Cassandra Nova, who's rumored to be the main villain of Deadpool 3. I say rumored because at the time that I'm recording this video, I don't entirely know whether or not it's been confirmed. And if I'm incorrect, feel free to leave a comment down below, which you undoubtedly will. But if it is Cassandra Nova, that's a big deal. Why? Because in Marvel Comics, Cassandra Nova was introduced in Grant Morrison's new X-Men run, specifically in a story called E is for Extinction. And in this story, Cassandra Nova sought out and discovered a guy named Donald Trask, the cousin of Bolivar Trask. You know Bolivar Trask from X-Men Days of Future Past? He was played by Peter Dinklage. In the comics, Bolivar Trask had developed something called a wild master mold in the sense that in Marvel Comics, Sentinels were initially developed by basically the US government itself and Bolivar Trask through its technology, but master mold was developed as a giant Sentinel that produced Sentinels. The idea behind the master mold wild Sentinel is that out in Ecuador, that this master mold would scavenge any and all technology around it and then build Sentinels out of that technology which basically made them highly adaptable because they were basically able to develop 
under any condition. Now, because only members of the Trask family were able to access the Wild Sentinel program, Cassandra Nova forced Donald Trask to basically activate the Wild Sentinels. Then she sent them to Genosha, which at that point in time was home to something like 16 million some odd mutants, and then massacred them all. Ironically enough, the character Negasonic Teenage Warhead actually debuted in ES4 Extinction. She was in there for like two or three panels and then died. But Cassandra Nova is as ruthless as she is powerful. More so than that, not only is she as capable as Professor Xavier when it comes to his telepathy, she's actually more powerful. Because in Marvel Comics, mutants have their main mutant power, then they also have what are called secondary or latent mutations, basically things that can happen with them. But the kicker about all this is that Cassandra Nova has all the powers that Professor Charles Xavier currently has and every power he could potentially have, at least with regards to telepathy. I promise you, if they do her justice in Deadpool 3 and she's anywhere near as powerful as she is in the comics, she will be an absolute demon. But then we cut to a scene where Deadpool looks like he's on some kind of a mission and is walking through what looks like an underground, albeit a high-end casino, in what's clearly Madripoor, or most likely Madripoor. And there's not one, but two major things to notice here. The first one is the most obvious one. The man at the very end of the hallway is basically Patch. For those of you guys who don't know what that is, Patch was a kind of alter ego of Wolverine that was introduced in 1988 with Wolverine issue number one. But more modern readers of Marvel Comics will be aware of Patch from what is arguably one of the worst storylines that's ever been written by Marvel Comics, which was a comic called Infinity Warps. And this in reality was just the result of basically Gamora using the Infinity Gauntlet to warp reality, fold it on itself, that kind of thing. Anyway, the whole reason why I say there are two major things going on is because of the story Infinity Warps in the sense that it wasn't just Patch, it was Diamond Patch or Patch Diamond, whatever you want to call it. It was the result of Wolverine and Emma Frost being merged into one character. Why do I say that matters? Because as most people know, Emma Frost is a beautiful woman with blonde hair. And in this scene where he's walking down the hallway, this is entirely speculation, a lot of emphasis seems to be placed on a woman in a red dress who has blonde hair. Now, normally Emma Frost appears in some kind of a white outfit. And if this woman was dressed in white, it would be an obvious giveaway and allusion to the fact that it is Emma Frost. And she's not the only person that's looking at Deadpool. So there really isn't any reason to believe that there is anything special about her. I just kind of want to believe that there is. But focusing back on Patch himself, whether or not this is the Wolverine that we're most familiar with, just kind of operating in some kind of underground capacity, trying to gain information and maybe carrying out his own mission, or this is potentially Deadpool in an alternate reality due to the actions of the TVA, we don't know. And we won't know until either another trailer comes out that expands on this or the movie's released and we can find out firsthand. But from there, we cut to the void at the very end of time. And whether you need a refresher or you have no idea what's going on, Here's how all this stuff works. So when Loki first kicked off, we were introduced to the Time Variance Authority and the Time Variance Authority was there to basically make sure that people stayed within their lane, quote unquote, and didn't make changes to their timelines by going back in the past or potentially going into the future. We didn't really know why, but then we all found out that at the very end of Loki season one, you had He Who Remains. And He Who Remains is a version of Kang the Conqueror, and that at some point in the multiverse's history, a war broke out between all the Kangs and almost led to the complete and total destruction of the multiverse. In order to prevent that from happening, He Who Remains ended up weaponizing Eliath, just this giant cloud of energy that was capable of wiping out whole universes, and he did exactly that. He basically wiped out every single universe that had any other version of Kang then himself. Then he in turn created the TVA and established the sacred timeline. And what the TVA was doing is they were going from one universe to the next anytime anybody did anything that would lead to that universe branching off and then forming another universe that would lead to the development of a variant of Kang the Conqueror that was not he who remains. Now, as we also know at the end of Loki season two, that Loki came to the realization that the multiverse needed to be free. And that if there were all these different variants of Kang running around, well, that's just the cost of doing business. And the universe and the multiverse is gonna have to find some way to deal with it. So Loki sits at the end of everything on a chair, holding the multiverse together, 
probably hoping against hope that the multiverse will find a way to defeat all the Kings, lest it be conquered by all the Kings. There you go. The entirety of what's happening in the multiverse saga summed up in like a minute. So as you can probably imagine, if everything that the TVA have pruned or removed, quote unquote, from a timeline have been thrown to the void at the end of time, which includes portions and sections of entire universes, this void's got to be pretty gigantic. And so because we're seeing this new depiction of this void, I think it's awesome because what it's showing us is that this place is quite literally huge, much bigger than we ever imagined it being, which makes sense because by and large, whenever we saw the void at the end of time in the Loki TV series, it was for the most part in a geographic area that was relatively close to the Citadel of He Who Remains, meaning we just didn't really see that much of it. Now, the fact that we see the 20th Century Fox logo here shows us that basically somewhere along the line, the entire 20th Century Fox universe of the X-Men and all those characters were pruned from the multiverse and most likely sent here. I would even take it a step further and say the only people who survived the pruning process were those individuals that we're going to see in this movie, most notably Pyro, and Wolverine. Now we'll talk about Wolverine here in a minute and specifically we'll talk about that Secret Wars comic because that really just kind of tells us what's going to happen over the course of this film and what's really going to happen in Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars. But the awesome thing here is the return of Pyro. Now I always loved Pyro as a character because unlike Johnny Storm, Sunfire, or Sunspot who have the ability to create fire and manipulate fire, Pyro only has the ability to manipulate fire. But because he's so much older and because he is what's clearly the leader of a group of survivors that have managed to just make a living for themselves, build some kind of a life for themselves inside the void at the end of all things, this likely just shows us he's gonna be part of the Exiles team. Of course, we also see a few other things inside this void. We see a helicarrier out in the distance, a Chitauri Leviathan, a Golden Gate Bridge, this guy's not Dr. Doom, although I will say when I first saw the trailer, I had to go back and watch it because I thought it was. It'd be weird to see Dr. Doom standing there with a gun, but hey, Fox are the ones that made him into a crash test dummy, so anything's possible. But now let's answer the biggest question that everyone is asking. How does this tie into Avengers Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars? Okay, so first things first, Let's talk about the Exiles. So what are the Exiles in Marvel Comics? The Exiles is basically a multiversal group that is composed of characters that you're familiar with, albeit from alternate realities. And the role of the Exiles is to deal with threats on a multiversal level. So as an arbitrary list of Exiles here, let's say for example, the team starts off with the original Avengers from the Avengers film in 2012. What'll happen is they'll be gathered together, they'll be sent out into the multiverse, they'll deal with some threat. Now, let's say that Captain America dies. He'll be replaced by somebody from an alternate reality, which could be John Krasinski, Reed Richards, and they'll continue on with their mission until maybe Tony Stark dies, and then he's replaced by somebody else from an alternate reality. But it always follows that form and function. Now, I don't think that that's what's going to happen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but what I do believe is going to happen is Deadpool is going to form a team that's going to go into the multiverse and it's going to serve the purpose of basically building itself. What he's effectively doing is finding characters in the multiverse that can help defeat variants of Kang the Conqueror. He's basically building an army. Now, why do I say that's the case? Because in this scene where Deadpool is laying on the ground, you see a comic laying there. That is the cover to Secret Wars issue number five. And this is the comic where you learned everything that had actually transpired at the end of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run. So time for an explanation, which by the way, we have all this covered. You'll find a link to the playlist for it at the end of this video, I promise you. It's the greatest comic book story arc that you've ever heard of in your life. In effect, what had happened here is the multiverse was basically ending. We didn't really know why. You simply had the incursions. 
Earths crashing into each other. Come to find out what had happened is that in the multiverse, in every single universe, there is a Molecule Man, Owen Reese. This guy's origin is exactly the same across every universe. It never changes. And the reason why is because he was created by what were called the Beyonders. Basically these just crazy, omnipotent, powerful beings. And because the Molecule Man's power was to alter reality on a universal scale, his death would lead to the destruction of an entire universe. The goal of the Beyonders was to detonate every Molecule Man across the multiverse at one time, and in doing so, blow up the whole multiverse, just to see what would happen. So Doctor Doom and Molecule Man from the main Marvel Universe learn about this, they go to an alternate reality, they kill that Molecule Man, which blows up the whole universe. That explosion pushes the universes next to it into the universes next to them, which basically explode. Hence the nature of the incursions. And it goes on and on and on and on until the entire multiverse is destroyed. The problem here, and what was explained in Secret Wars issue number five, is Doctor Doom came to the realization they wouldn't be able to destroy every single Molecule Man across the multiverse in time to stop the Beyonders from blowing up all the remaining Molecule Men and ending the multiverse. And so while he did things like create the Black Swans and so on and so forth, the grand plan of Doctor Doom was to gather together as many Molecule Men as he could possibly find, draw the Beyonders out, and then send the Molecule Men to fight the Beyonders. What the Molecule Men did instead is they exploded, which basically killed the Beyonders but wiped out most of the multiverse. And so Dr. Doom stole the power of the Beyonders, saved what was left across the multiverse, and then formed Battle World. That goes into Secret Wars 2015. At the end of Battle World, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four basically snaps his fingers, fixes everything, and the entirety of the multiverse comes back. Having said all of that, here's exactly what I think Deadpool is doing with regards to Kang Dynasty and Avengers Secret Wars. What I think is happening here is Deadpool 3 is going to focus on the early stages of him building this army, basically grabbing different members of what were basically X-Men or superheroes from the Fox universe. And when I say grabbing different members, I mean the only ones we care about, which coincidentally happened to be the only ones who survived. And that at the end of the movie, he and Wolverine, which most likely it'll just be Wolverine and himself, they'll go into the multiverse. And that while they will effectively be building an army and creating the exiles, it won't necessarily be called that, but they'll be traveling across the multiverse, assembling an army of superheroes that all serve different purposes. Maybe Peter Parker from the main Marvel Cinematic Universe will be one of them. Maybe it'll be Reed Richards from an alternate reality, the Fantastic Four, who knows? I have no idea how it'll unfold. But much like what we saw with Jonathan Hickman's full Avengers The New Avengers run going into Secret Wars, that in the end, it's all going to come down to a gigantic battle between Kang the Conqueror and the army that's been assembled by Deadpool, although I doubt he'll be the leader of that army because you know, I mean, it's Deadpool. And so what this will do is it'll lead to quote unquote battle world in Secret Wars. That's likely where this kind of final stand of the war will take place. When it ends, you're gonna see the multiverse destroyed in its entirety. There's not gonna be a need for Loki anymore, so he's gonna pass on to the afterlife. All the different superheroes that we know will somehow continue on into this new universe, and that will be the timeline going forward. But that's just my thought on this. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. With that being said, we're gonna bring this to an end. Make sure you guys click this link to the playlist for Avengers and New Avengers and Secret Wars 2015. I promise you're gonna love it, and I will catch you all later. Peace.